Good morning, Abundant Life. We invite y'all to stand and worship with us this morning. We serve a risen Savior, right? Amen. He has conquered death. He's defeated the grave. We serve a risen King. has the final word the cross has the final word sorrow may come in the darkest night but the cross has the final
that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the brain has no claim on me. Let's sing that again. billion or more brothers and sisters who celebrate today the day in history where they came to the tomb and found it empty. He is not dead, he is alive, and he lives in us today. Father, we thank you for this day. It is the day where heaven and earth connect. It's a day where you give the very best you have, and we offer you now our highest praise. Thank you for speaking to the people of God. Thank you that the one who came in with the greatest need will be the one who receives the most today. We honor you, and we exalt the name of Jesus in the house of the Lord today. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. amen. Well, before you're seated, make sure you know who you're worshiping near. Introduce yourself uh, to somebody, maybe for the first time. And we welcome those of you who are worshiping with us on live stream. It is Easter Sunday. What a blessing. Packed house here. Churches all over the world who exalt the name Jesus are celebrating the greatest day in the history of the world, what it means to each of us. So glad you're here. Now, it is special for so many reasons here today at Abundant Life not the least of which the ones who've traveled the farthest to be in this celebration service this morning haven't seen them in a while it's been too long they were raised in this church and we sent them off to the mission field they've planted so many churches in nicaragua they've lived there for almost a quarter of a century now 
Brian and Millie Hudson are home from Nicaragua. Their son, Paul, stand up, stand up. We welcome you. These are our homegrown heroes. Brian and Millie Hudson, Paul and Luke, and Luke is uh, in Managua today, couldn't make the trip, but their older son, Paul, flew in from Chattanooga just to be in church with us this morning and seeing mom and dad a, a perk, a side benefit, but uh, we welcome all of you. And on that note, I'll mention that I believe it's two weeks from today, Pastor Brian Hudson will be ministering to us, always brings a good word. And uh, we're just so proud of them and what they're doing uh, in the church planting and raising up pastors and church leaders. Nicaragua has been changed by the gifts of God in their life, and, and we claim them. Uh, they're home today, so we're grateful for that. I do want to mention that as you came in, uh, many of you have already taken family pictures, uh, selfies with your phone in front of our beautiful backdrop out there. If by chance you slipped in and uh, did not get your picture made, it can be iconic. You'll never forget this day, so we encourage you on your way out, uh, take a picture with you and uh, your family. And Nick Campbell will be assisting you back there. Thank you, Nick, for uh, giving all of us something we will cherish forever. A beautiful Easter Sunday picture. And some of you've dressed up real nice. I come like I always do. Uh, but uh, we're just glad that you're here. I do want to mention also uh, just a few weeks from now, a two-day encounter crusade. It's a citywide encounter, and uh, it's held at the Sempt Center, uh, Florence Darlington Tech's auditorium. And... Uh, uh, Jolly and Margaret are heading that up, hosting it again this year. And so if you've not registered for this conference, there's information out in the lobby on the table. On your way out, get one of these. We encourage you to register and be a part of this two days of an encounter with God. Our city will have an encounter with God. So be a part of that. And then finally, before we get into the Word, I'll mention that uh, you may have received one of these on your way in. We have a, uh, a very anointed and inspirational poet in residence, Miss Natalie B. And uh, she is blessing all of us and beyond with uh, an Easter poem. It's brand new, Yeshua, the sacred Lamb of God. I'm going to be talking about the Lamb of God in just a few minutes but take this uh, with you. If you didn't get one on the way in, they're on the table as you uh, leave today. And uh, let that be a blessing to you and your family on Easter Sunday. Well, let's get into the Word. What a great day. Every pastor in the world is preaching the same message this morning. Of course, it is Easter Sunday. And give me just a few minutes. Here's what's going down this morning in real time right here at Abundant Life. I'm going to share a good word because it comes from the book, and it's good if it comes from the book. And then uh, we're going to close our service with another praise and worship song. But before we do and before we begin, ushers, if you will, come. And uh, we'll give you an opportunity to give in uh, the tithe and offering. And just before they begin serving you, I don't ever do this. I don't think I've ever done it before. But I'm going to give you my full sermon in one sentence. Now, give me a few minutes afterwards. <laughs> but everybody will leave today knowing exactly what the message was. My message, the entire sermon, can be summarized in one sentence, and the sentence is this. The church is full because the grave is empty. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Ushers, you may serve the people of God, and thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Now, last week, Holy Week began on Palm Sunday. This was the day in history where Jesus rode into town on a 
a donkey. And the people in Jerusalem were so happy to see him, they would throw palm branches in front of the donkey as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. It was called his triumphant entry. And the crowds of the people were chanting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was Palm Sunday one week ago. And seven days after that day, quickly spiraled downward. Betrayal, denial, his arrest, his sham trial, his beatings, his torture, finally his crucifixion, and then ultimately his resurrection. All of that happened in one week. And today is the day we celebrate his being raised back to life. Now, I mentioned last Sunday on Palm Sunday as we began retracing the steps of the Lord during Holy Week or Passion Week, there were two million people in Jerusalem during the first Palm Sunday because it happened to be the annual observance. All of the children of Israel made a pilgrimage, if they could, to Jerusalem. And they came to celebrate what was known as the Passover. Josephus, a secular historian whose job it was to accurately record the events of his day in the first century. And he said that an estimate would be two million Israelites were in town that day. And according to the culture and the custom and their experience in worship, they would sacrifice lambs and enjoy the Passover meal. Josephus, the historian, estimated that there were 250,000 lambs sacrificed. And the blood of the sacrificed lambs during Passover would be accepted by God to cover the sins of the people for a year. It was a bloody mess. We talked last week about Passover, how that God's people had been in oppression. They had been slaves to an evil ruler, Pharaoh, in a godless nation, Egypt, until God spoke to Moses. And let's notice today how Moses is a type and a shadow, a forerunner of Christ. Moses heard the voice of God in a burning bush, and God said to Moses, I have seen the oppression of my people. I have heard their cries, and God said, I am aware of their suffering, and I have come down to rescue them. Have you ever been so desperate, in such pain, your life so far off track, that you wanted to look up to heaven and say, God, if you're real, if you really exist, please come down and rescue me. We've been there. All of us have been there. But corporately, the entire nation of Israel who were captives and slaves under an evil, brutal dictator, for 400 years they had suffered like this, and God had had enough, and he raised up Moses. And then we talked last week about the ten plagues of Egypt. We're leading up to the significance of Passover, revisiting just briefly from last week. God said, I'm going to deal with Pharaoh, and you tell him, I said, to let my people go. But Pharaoh's heart was so hardened, so evil, that he would not hear God speak. So God said to Moses, I'm going to send 10 plagues in Egypt. And when I'm finished with these 10 plagues, Pharaoh will soften his heart and let my people go free. And quickly, we'll review the first plague was the water 
in Egypt was turned into blood. It made fish die in the rivers. There was a stench from the rivers. No one could drink the water. It was turned into blood. The second plague God sent was frogs. The Bible says frogs in every house, in every bowl, in the kitchen cupboard, in every bed, frogs were a plague. The third plague was lice. Every particle of dust became lice, the Bible says. And then the next plague was flies. The land was corrupted, the Bible says, because of the swarms of the flies. And then the next plague, the cattle in the nation were diseased, became sick, and many died. And with every plague, instead of Pharaoh's heart softening and realizing God must be real and he's wanting his people to be set free, instead of that, the Bible says his heart even became more hardened. And then the next plague, boils would appear on man and beast. The next plague, hail. And the Bible says it was very heavy hail that killed beasts in the field and destroyed trees and crops. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hard. He was not going to let God rescue his people. And then there were locusts. That was the ninth plague or the eighth plague. And the Bible says it was such darkness covering the earth so densely that no one could even see the ground. Now, that is dark. Darkness that could be felt. And then finally, the tenth plague was the death of the firstborn. God said to Moses, on a certain night, gave him the date, I'm going to send a death angel through Egypt. And the death angel is going to visit every house in the nation and strike the oldest son dead in every home. Not only the oldest son but the oldest beast owned by that family would be dead. The death angel would come through the nation and claim the life of the oldest son in every home in Egypt. And God said to Moses, but I want to spare all of my people from that. So he gave Moses an instruction and told Moses to pass the word. I'm telling you, if you're among God's people, Inside information is available to us that will save our lives. The world knows nothing about it. Only the people of God is provided with this inside information. God said to Moses, on this date, when the death angel passes through about midnight and strikes to death the firstborn son in every home, I want my people spared. All of the children of Israel will be spared. No death will come to their house on that night. And he told Moses what to do. He said, tell all of my people on that evening to sacrifice a lamb and take the blood of that lamb and put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost the sides of the door and over the top of the door, the blood of the lamb that they sacrificed. And God said to Moses and to his people, when the death angel comes through Egypt to strike dead the firstborn in every home, when he sees the blood, he will not judge that home. No death will come to that home the death angel will pass over that home because of the blood of the lamb. And that's exactly what happened. The oldest son in every Egyptian home died at midnight that night. There was national mourning because so much death 
had occurred, nobody saw it coming except God's people who were forewarned and were protected by the blood, the blood of the Lamb that they had slain as a sacrifice and as an offering. I held up this book last week. I read a paragraph or two out of it. I won't reread it, but I will remind you of what it said. This is Terry Tripp's newest book called Grace on Steroids. God's super grace is why we're here. There was a cost that had to be paid. We owed it and couldn't pay it. Jesus didn't owe it, but he paid the debt we couldn't pay because of God's goodness and his grace toward us. And here's the point I made last week from this book. I'll repeat it again. Terry brings out this point powerfully in the book. He said, notice that God did not tell the death angel when you pass over the homes and you see the blood over the door. You go inside and see if they've paid up on their tithe. You go inside and ask some questions. See how their behavior has been this past week. You go inside that house and be sure they've forgiven everybody of every offense that's ever been committed against them. You go inside that house and make sure they're pure and perfect and behaving in every way. He didn't say that at all. Grace on steroids. The instruction God gave the death angel is you don't even need to go inside and see what they're doing and how they're doing and ask them any. When you see the blood pass over that house, <laughs> the blood of the lamb. Exodus 12 and 13, now the blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now Moses was a type and a shadow, a forerunner, you might say, of Jesus who would come and rescue God's people and pay the price for the sins of the whole world because he shed blood and he was the Lamb of God. Another forerunner that deserves mention today is the father of our faith, Abraham. In Genesis chapter 22 and beginning at verse 1, a familiar story. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And God said, take now your son. Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two young men with him and Isaac his son and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. And then down at verse 7, Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And then Isaac said, Look, the fire and the wood but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went up together. So much in that story of Abraham offering Isaac as a sacrifice that parallels the coming of the Lord Jesus because, first of all, Isaac was born miraculously. His father was 100 and his mother Sarah was 90. They had years earlier passed the age of childbearing. It took a miracle for Isaac to be conceived and for Sarah to give birth to Isaac, 
who was the son of promise, the promise God had made to Abraham. Now, so it was with Mary. The conception of our Lord Jesus and his birth was supernatural. She had never known a man, and yet the virgin conceived and was with child and brought forth the baby Jesus, who was the Savior of the world. Now, Abraham knew. Isaac is my seed. God finally kept his promise to me, but it's not over yet. Because God promised me that my descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the pebbles of sand on the seashore. And if I obey God in what he's asking me to do, if I sacrifice my son Isaac on an altar, then I am stopping the promise God made me. Have you ever faced anything and you just didn't understand why God was requiring something of you? Abraham had a legitimate question to ask. God, if I obey you in doing this, then how will I ever have descendants that would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore? But he didn't let that stop him from obeying the word God had given him. And then another parallel between Isaac and Jesus. God said to Abraham, take your only son. Well, now he had had another son, but it was by the flesh, Ishmael. It was not the son of promise, supernaturally given by God. God didn't even acknowledge that which was born of the flesh, Ishmael. God called Isaac Abraham's only son. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Then another thing, if you read all of that account in Genesis chapter 22, uh, it was a three days journey. Uh, God spoke to Abraham and said, I want you to go to a certain mountain. I'll tell you exactly the spot when you get there. Uh, and the Bible says the very, the very next verse. So Abraham rose early the next morning. No pushback, no negotiation, no work around. No, but God, can I uh, talk with you about this first? Nope. God says, I want you to offer your son as a sacrifice on an altar to me. Very next word. So Abraham got early, the next, got up early the next morning, got his donkey and brought two men with him. That's significant because when Jesus died on the cross, there were two men there too. Oh my, such rich, significant parallels that begins with Abraham and Isaac being a forerunner of Jesus. A three days journey it was. That's how long Jesus was in the tomb. And while he was there, he went to hell and set things right and brought the keys of death, hell, and the grave back from that place. And then on the day one of the church, he gave us those keys. And then it took place at Mount Moriah. I've been to Mount Moriah. This is the mountain historically where Abraham strapped his only son Isaac on the altar and was ready to fully obey God with every intention in his heart. He was going to obey God and offer his son as a sacrifice. Mount Moriah is also the place where Solomon's temple would be built. Now it's called the Temple Mount. And Mount Moriah, right there in the outskirts of Jerusalem, is a 37-acre tract of land. It's the most valuable piece of real estate on the planet. And it's the most hotly contested piece of real estate on earth. 
because three of the world's largest religions claim it as holy ground. The Jews, because that's where Abraham offered Isaac. The Christians, because that's where the temple was built. And the Muslims claim it as their holy ground, and they've built the Dome of the Rock. It's a Muslim shrine, all right there in that 37 acres on Mount Moriah. And the Dome of the Rock was built 1,300 years ago by uh, the Muslims. So three world religions claim that track of ground as holy ground. And it said that inside the Dome of the Rock is beard from Abraham's face. It's there inside Dome of the Rock. Abraham was a forerunner. If Abraham had not had the faith he had, then God could have bypassed humanity and said, well, there's nobody down there with any faith at all to match mine. So uh, I'll just start over with a new creation. God could have done anything he wanted. But Romans chapter 4 and verse 20, talking about Abraham, the father of our faith, it says, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, here's Abraham, and being fully convinced that what God had promised he was also able to perform it. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Oh, God made a covenant. The correct terminology is God cut covenant with Abraham because Abraham believed God. He was fully convinced that what God promised he was able to perform. That brings back memories to me. Thank you, those of you who were here on day one of our church, when we first started, our, the very first sermon I preached was out of Romans chapter 4, and uh, it was titled, The Keeper of the Promise. That's the first sermon I preached, and I practiced on you folks. <laughs> Thank you for not giving up on me and letting me grow, and I still am, and we're all growing together, but... When Abraham obeyed God, and of course you know the story, an angel was dispatched to instantly stop the hand of Abraham with the dagger as he was uh, plunging into the chest of his son in an act of obedience to God. God stopped him and said, nope, now I know. Now I know I've got to give my son. I've got to be willing to give my son. If you... In the old covenant, Abraham had this much faith to give your only son that you love? God said, by covenant, I've got to offer mine now. So Abraham and Isaac were forerunners to the Messiah, the Son of God, the Christ Jesus, our Lord. The most for, a famous forerunner, however, John the Baptist. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, it says this, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, if it weren't for this sentence, we wouldn't be here today. Why would we even bother to be in church today or any day? The church would never have been established if it had not been for this line. John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's why we're here. Up until Jesus became the Lamb of God, of God and shed his blood, the blood of the Lamb of God that was shed so that our sin could be forgiven. Before that happened, even the people of God who loved God depended on the blood of a bull or a goat or a lamb or a sheep or a ram. 
and God would honor the sacrifice. That was the best they could do in that covenant. And he would accept the blood of an animal to cover the sins of the people for a year. They'd have to come back and do it again next year and bring the best they had, not the worst, not the runt of the litter, but the best they had. They had to do it every year because the blood of an animal was not powerful enough to cleanse anybody from sin, simply cover their sin for a year and then do it all over again. This happened for thousands of years until the Lamb of God shed his blood. And those of us today who have placed our trust and our faith in Jesus being the Son of God, in his death and the shedding of his blood that could cleanse us, not simply cover for a while, but cleanse us from our sin. My, my, if it weren't for the Lamb of God who shed his blood to forgive the sins of the world, uh, there would be no church. We'd be wasting our time. There would be no body of Christ for us to be a part of. That's the thing that changed forever. Paul said in the New Testament, we had no hope and we were without God in the world. But now we who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Behold the Lamb of God. And his blood has brought us near to God. We went from no hope and without God to being brought near by the blood of Christ. Paul also said, and I like this, it's like sticking the knife in the devil's back and twisting it just a little. Paul said, if the devil had known what he was doing, he would never have crucified the Lord of glory. The devil, not all that. He just didn't even know what he was doing. He was playing right into God's grand plan to redeem humanity after the devil had messed it up as far back as the Garden of Eden. Oh, how much better is the new covenant that we enjoy today than the old? Hebrews chapter 9 says, uh, that the Old Testament required the blood of an animal. But how much more shall the blood of Christ cleanse us from our sin and put us in right standing with God? And I say this every Easter. Every Easter. No one needs to leave here today with their sins unforgiven. What are you waiting for? Yes. It is finished. Yes. The price is paid. Yes. It's a blessing and a benefit for us, and it's a free gift. Behold the Lamb of God, and it's the blood of the Lamb that cleanses us from sin. I'd like for the praise and worship team to come back if they will. We're going to close our special Easter service with another song together before we leave. There may be some here today, and I will just give you the benefit of the doubt, which faith does. Faith gives us the benefit of the doubt. But there may be some of you here today that are struggling with confusion. I'm not sure if I'm ready uh, to meet the Lord if I die today. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. If you're in church on Easter Sunday, you've got enough faith to work with. You've got enough working for you already. And grace gives the benefit of the doubt. And every one of us, even those of us who believe and have been believing for every one of us could take one step closer to God today. Our distance from God is determined by us. 
There were 5,000 in the crowd, and some were at the back of the crowd just close enough to get fish and bread when they distributed food, just close enough to hear faintly the word at a distance. And then there were others in the crowd that said, I want to get closer than that. And so there were 12. They were chosen by God to be, not to do for him, but to be with him. Chosen by God. Is that you? Is that where you are in the crowd? Do you realize God has chosen me to be with him? Be still and know that I am God. And of the 12 who were closer than the 5,000, there were three of those 12 who said, even this is not close enough. I want to be still closer than this. There was Peter, James, and John, and they were so close to Jesus that he would call them to his side, and, and they would witness certain things that the other nine of the 12 and the other thousands in the crowd did not witness. They were that close to Jesus. And then of those three, there was one that said, this is not close enough for me. It was John who Jesus would call the beloved. And it was John the beloved, the one who was closer to Jesus than anybody else when he was on earth. It was John the beloved seated next to Jesus at that famous portrait of the Last Supper and John the Beloved was leaning his head on the shoulder of Jesus close enough probably to hear the heartbeat of Jesus. Where are you in the crowd? Oh, I will give you the benefit of the doubt. You're in church worshiping God on Sunday morning. You must believe Jesus is the Son of God. And for you to come on Easter when you know what it's about, God raised Jesus, the slain lamb, back from the dead. And he's alive today. You must believe it or you wouldn't be here. I give you the benefit of the doubt. But all of us intentionally can take one step closer today. Draw nearer to God. The Bible says draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Will you stand with me please? Everybody standing, bow your heads. Every head bowed. Sacred moment. This moment is sacred. Please don't spoil the sanctity of this moment by looking around. I'm going to ask a question and ask you to raise your hands where you are if, if I'm talking to you. But if you're here this morning on Easter Sunday and you say, I believe in God, of course. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he died for me. His blood paid the price that my sin could be forgiven. But I want to be sure I'm in right standing with God, and I want prayer. Standing where I am, I want to know right here, right now, that I'm in right relationship with God. Raise your hand if that's you. Anybody struggling with doubt, God bless the hands. God bless the hands that are going up. That's okay. Thank you for being honest. God bless the hands. Father, I thank you for this day and what it means to the world. Thank you that you were not greedy, keeping your only son to yourself, but you released him to the earth to be born as a baby, to grow up and live a sinless life. The only human being that's ever walked the earth that qualifies to pay the supreme sacrifice and become the Lamb of God whose blood was shed for the forgiveness of the world. Lord, we intentionally now in our mind, in our spirit, we acknowledge your Lordship over our life. Those who are frustrated or confused or those who entertain doubts would you let them know right now as we sing this song right where they are would you let them know on this resurrection sunday that you have accounted their faith for righteousness and you have placed them in right standing before god if you agree with that say amen, amen. And let me just say this before the worship team leads us in a song as we close our service. You've heard it said all of your life, march 
comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb. This is the last day of the month of March. And on this Easter Sunday, March 31, March goes out like a lamb. Would you welcome our praise and worship team as they minister?
blood of the Lamb. Thank you for worshiping an abundant life on Easter Sunday. Go and have a great resurrection day. March is going out like a lamb. Thank <laughs> you.